Welcome to TK and Drinks. This is What's the Story with Mr. Carlos, I believe it's Bassetti. That's great. And uh, he is with our Tivium Meadery up there in Bellingham, or right there in the Bellingham region of Washington State. Just looking at the, uh, looking Canada right up the nose. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's going to enlighten us on some fantastic mead making processes just give us a little insight into the the world of mead up there at artivium meadery so how are you doing today carlos doing good uh and it's actually art of them art of them okay i, I always get that wrong and make Don't it worry. A not a big deal. uh art of them meadery and that is a um combination of latin words if memory serves from what you guys had uh, said online that is correct. Yeah, it's a combination of artist and Avum, art and bird. Yes. We wanted a name that kind of spoke to kind of our things that were important to us uh, in, in making a, a company. So those kind of represent creativity and community for us. And that was one of the things I was going to ask you about is um, all of your meads have bird or uh, bird related names. And that has to go back to the, um, to the community aspect. Yeah. Yeah, we, we really want to kind of, um, we wanted everything in the business to kind of tie back together. So uh, you'll see a lot of bird imagery and, and things kind of calling back to that on, on all of our stuff. Right on. It's definitely one of the more unique and uh, recognizable logos and themes in the mead world there. I, th I thought that was very cool. Um, one of my favorites I've had from you guys so far has been the... Uh, the uh, red-tailed hawk that was absolutely phenomenal like, hands down one of my favorites man um so um see here for a lot of people who don't know you've been in the mead making game for a while now um been making mead for i don't know over 10 15 years at this point i mean professionally Professionally, let's see, I started professionally, it would have been in 2014. Okay, so you're looking at seven years there professionally? Yeah, and then uh, before that, I was, you know, kind of a passionate hobbyist and home brewer for a long time. Right on. Probably, you know, eight, eight or nine years before that. Got you. And there's, um, I'm sure in that time you've had some of the, uh, your favorite meads that you made. What is one of the favorite meads that you've made in that, um, in your time frame? Maybe not even something you've released commercially, but just if thinking back on all those years. I, you know, one of the first meads I made um, was a, a prickly pear mead. Yes. And not the best mead I've ever made, but I always remember it fondly, you know, it, it being the first. Awesome. Um, I made it way too sweet and then it hung out in bottles and kind of slowly re-fermented and became kind of slightly pedalant over the years and okay. it became really delicious. Awesome. Uh, but I, I always remember that one fondly. Unfortunately, it's all gone now. But we, one of those happy accidents that we can't recreate again. Yeah. Uh, that's always unfortunate. I love hearing about those stories. What is it you're drinking on there? I'm sorry, something, uh, some special project you're working on? Uh, this is actually something we just released uh, fairly recently. Okay. The Scarlet Ibis. Oh, yes. Uh, Marionberry Vanilla Mead. Oh, Marionberry Vanilla. That, that sounds absolutely wonderful. You get those uh, directly from Oregon? Um, I believe these are Oregon Marionberries. We, we made this one with a, a juice. Oh, okay. So, since it's, uh, you know, out of season. Sure. Yeah, I imagine the Marion Bears aren't going to be in the season for another couple months here coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, um, I mean, you know, we, we only opened in September, so we yeah. haven't really been in, in prime, you know, prime fruit season yet. Yeah, so that, that's going to be exciting. I would say, yeah, a lot of people might not know that, but you guys have only been open for about six months now, seven months. Yeah. Before you guys are... Uh, going hard and heavy. What made you guys choose Bellingham, Washington of all places to, uh, to open up shop? It's a quite a small little uh, town. It's wonderful. I've been there a lot of times. So we chose Bellingham. Um, I, I grew up uh, in California by the ocean 
And so after being in Arizona for 14 years, you know, it's kind of missing the coast and yes. water. <laughs> um, yeah, something that's not hot and dry. Yeah. So, so we were kind of looking coastal and, and looking around and, and Micah and I, neither of us really wanted to be in a city. Mm -hmm. We're not, not really city people. Um, and Bellingham is kind of, it ticked all the boxes. Um, you know, it's close enough to major population centers. We got Seattle, you know, hour and a half south. We got Vancouver, hour north. Yep. Um, and, you know, our tasting room is, is right on the water, beautiful location. The mountains are 45 minutes away. Um, I can walk into the woods from my back door. So, and, and it's got a crazy density of craft breweries. Yes, very much. I think there are like 15 or 16 breweries in Bellingham. You could probably walk to six or seven breweries from our tasting room. That's freaking amazing. Have you guys thought about doing any collabs with any of them for any like braggots or anything like that? Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to start doing that. You know, we've, with, with COVID going on and, you know, starting a new business, it's kind of been, all our focus has been on, on kind of doing things here. But as, as we kind of get our feet underneath ourselves and things start to open up again, we're definitely going to be doing that. That's freaking awesome to hear. I, I'd like to see more um, commercial braggots out there. There's not a whole lot. And uh, I, I'd especially like to see some super quality ones out there. Um, a lot of people may not know that you uh, had worked at another meadery before that, um, before you were at Art of Um Was there any, um, what was your biggest piece of information that you learned previously that you've taken with you where you're at now? Um. Uh, a huge thing that we learned was was how to scale effectively. Oh, that's a good one to know. <laughs> um, because when when we were at Superstition, you know, we we helped grow from making sixty gallon batches in a basement to making thousand gallon batches in a purpose built facility. Sure. So that learning process was was huge. And the fact that we know how to do that and we've done it before is, is pretty huge. Yeah. Um, I, I think another thing, another really huge thing we learned is just like kind of how we would want to run a business. Um, and you know how we might want to do some things the same and, and some things differently. So yeah, yeah. Uh, being a part of that was a really great learning experience. Nice. Uh, would you have any tips for somebody who's trying to upscale at, in their, uh, homebrew world say even if it's not necessarily from 60 gallons up to a thousand but somebody who's trying to go say from five gallons up to a hundred gallons um any rules of thumb that should be generally followed so to speak i i would say you know know how you want to oxygenate and degas and add your nutrients and and just how you really need to think through how you're gonna um, perform all your processes yes in kind of a more in-depth way as you start to scale up you know when, when you're making five gallon batches it's you know whatever happens it's not you know it's not a huge deal sure you know you have you, know, you off gas a little too aggressively you have a little foam over you know you lose a cup or two, it's, you know, not the end of the world, you make a mess. You know, you start doing that with 100 gallons and, you know, now you're sudden, sudden, sudden lost 10 gallons of mead and, you know, it becomes a little more of a, a big deal. Right, and I'm sure that that um, it gets exponentially larger the bigger your batches get. Yep. So, yeah, man, that's a, that's a fantastic piece of advice. So it's almost like you need to have um, – like a process and procedures manual, not to say uh, manual, but certainly a, a sheet, the processes and procedures steps to follow. So you can recreate that just as if you were a, a baker or a chemist or any other, you know, somebody you need to have yeah. steps. To I, things, I think 
One of the biggest things um, about going from kind of the home home brewing, home scale to to professional is is having that um, documentation and repeatability is super important because as a business you want to you want to be able to make something that's maybe not exactly the same but similar at least right and i think i think with me there is quite a bit of flexibility and understanding that batch to batch it's going to be you know there's going to be a little bit of variability but you don't want it to be you know hugely sure. variable you know from from one to the next yeah, some people even desire it in, uh, you know, slight differences from a B1 to a B2 or something like that. But yeah, you definitely want to have at least, I would say, a good 85, 90% repeatability, you know, beyond what you're going to get from the uh, the variations in the honeys and the yeasts and whatnot. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, having having that, having those variables be introduced by the fruit or the honey, mm -hmm. by those agricultural sources, that's that's great. You know, that's that can be desirable, but you don't want to have those, um, you don't want to be introducing um, differences and variables in your processes. Gotcha. So you, you want your processes to be dialed in. You want those to be similar or the same every time. As fixed as possible. And you want those, you want to, you want to create the environment where the honey can, can kind of introduce its terroir and it's, its own character or the fruit can introduce its character. And, and so that when you, when you have those different products, people can tell that it's like, oh, you know, like the fruit change or the honey change. And it's not like, oh, they really messed up on their nutrient additions. And like, these taste wildly different. Right. Man, that's a, uh, it seems like it's a pretty, intense process there is it would you say that you spend more time in the pre-production and planning stages and so to speak than you do in the actual production part or is it a good 50 50 or how does that work um i'd say that that we've been doing it long enough that um that we don't have to put a lot of time into the pre-production sure. you know I, I think that as you start to learn about different honeys and yeasts and and processes, you know, adding nutrients and what all these different ingredients and flavors can do and how they work together, you know, you want to spend more time doing, you know, small test batches and and trying things out and doing experiments and trials. But for us, we, we've been doing it long enough, you know, like I, I know when I add this amount of vanilla for this amount of time, like this is kind of the result that I'm going to get. Sure. And we're comfortable enough with that, that we can like throw all these different variables together Which is and, and, and come pretty close to a flavor profile that we're, that we're looking for. Like, uh, I think before we started recording, you were talking about, you tried the, the prodigal tortoise. Yes. Um, which That's is a, a, a mead with Belgian dark candy syrup, cow nibs, coffee, maple syrup, and orange zest. Yes. I believe, and we'd never made anything like that before, you know, but, but we've worked with all of those ingredients. Gotcha. So, you know, we didn't have to trial it a bunch. Um, you know, I knew that adding all those things at a certain ratio for a certain amount of time, we're going to get, you know, pretty close to where we want to be. Gotcha. Now, when you're making these, um, I say necessarily the test batches, but when you're doing something that you've never done before, do you guys try to target sweeten or do you uh, just ferment it dry and then back sweeten just for consistency's sake? Uh, you know, it really depends what we're going for. I, I generally prefer to um, leave some residual sugar in the fermentation. I, I personally, and this is just kind of our style, is that we add most of the honey up front and then, you know, let the fermentation stop or stop the fermentation and then leave that residual sweetness. And from what I understand, that's a much more difficult part uh, process than it is to just ferment dry and then back sweeten. Yeah, you kind of have to, you really have to understand your yeast and your nutrient additions and 
and kind of have a good idea of what's going on. Um, and th th there's nothing wrong with fermenting dry and back sweetening. Oh. Um, but especially this, and this is kind of another one of those things, like when you start to scale up, like doing that at five gallons, no problem, that's easy. When you start talking about, you know, larger batches, if you're gonna ferment a hundred gallons dry and then back sweeten, you have to think about how are you gonna get that honey in? Right. And that's... how are you, cause you can't just dump a five gallon bucket of honey in a hundred to a hundred gallons <laughs> and then hope for the best. Cause it's just gonna, it's just gonna sit on the bottom of the tank, you know? Very much uh, understand that for sure. Um, so, uh, so there's a science to it, I'm sure, because it, from as I understand, uh, my understanding of the situation, there's a lot of commercial places that do those larger batches in that, in that capacity, you know, I, the, it, so it's got to be a way to have it done, because again, as I understand, there's even um, award-winning meads that are done that way, so it's got to be something. Oh, yeah, and it's, it's, it's all about understanding your processes and building, you know, processes and procedures around those and you know having the proper equipment sure so i'm not saying that that's a bad way to do it or that people shouldn't but um you know it just it introduces more variables and challenges and if people are people want to do it that way and you're used to doing it that way and you think that produces you know good product then more power to you and but that's, that's not our style and that's not the way we prefer to do it generally. I mean, we do, um, we will sometimes, you know, I, I like to sometimes caramelize honey and back sweeten with that. Yes, I like to hear. Um, and that's, you know, has its own challenges as well, but. But it is uh, definitely something that uh, is not your guys' daily driver thing that you guys keep there as part of them. No. So let's crack open another bottle here from my friends up there at the Brimming Horn Meadery. This is the uh, Feathered Serpent, the Cocoa Nibs, Honey Agave, and I believe some Chipotle in there as well. Oh, yum. Yes, vanilla, some allspice. I don't know if you've had anything from these cats, but these guys do it up proper. Oh yeah, they're making great stuff. Yes, I need to, I've uh, been dying to talk to uh, John Talkington over there. That guy is a, uh, nothing short of a mad scientist when it comes to making mead as our, uh, as is yourself there, Mr. Bassetti. Um, so you've been doing this for uh, 14 years. What would you say is unfortunately the worst made that you've ever, uh, worst mead that you've ever made in that time frame? So if that was just an absolute drain pour or something that you had to set aside yeah. for a month and reuse. So I've had, I've had one thing that I've actually poured down the drain. Oh, okay. Just one. Just one. Uh, and it was a mead with pine tips. Ooh. And That's it was terrible. It smelled and tasted like pine saw. Mm. It was like cleanery, solventy, just undrinkable. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, but that's, you know, I, I think that's the only thing that I put down the drain. Was that pretty early in your process or your, uh, your mead making days? No, that was actually at Superstition. Oh, okay. Uh, but it, it was just, you know, it was a test batch. It was like two, two gallons, two or three gallons. That's a pretty bold move, though, to go straight up for the pine tips, though. I mean, have, have, you know, you grew up in California, so I'm sure you're at least somewhat familiar with the pine flavor and pine everything. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, and we'd actually made something with spruce tips. It yeah. was really good. So I thought, oh, you know, pine tips, yeah. that should be similar. I bet that'll be good, too. It was not. <laughs> <laughs> See, when I was, uh, I'm from Washington up there, a um, tiny little town down south called Bonnie Lake, between like Sumner, Puyallup, Auburn area. And uh, there's a brewery out in Buckley, Washington called the Elkhorn. And they had for a short period of time, I don't know if it's something they do regularly, but a stingy nettle barley wine was like 13%. 
it was the only time I've ever had stingy nettles and anything that was fermented. And my goodness, it was delicious. It had this almost unique, um, like a unique spiciness to it. It was, it was wonderful. I, I man, I'd die to have some of that again. But this was again years ago. That's uh, that's something I would I would definitely dig to see. Have you guys thought about doing any savory meads up there? You guys do wonderful sweet meads. I'm I'm just curious of where um, savory meads uh, lie in the whole process. I know there's a lot of cats out there that are fiddling with it. Yeah, well, we actually did a uh, not completely savory. We did a, a Thanksgiving mead. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, it was pumpkin, sweet potato, like pie spice um marshmallow mead yes 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 i do remember that coming across and did that was that received well yeah it was it was delicious hey so what about taking that sweet potato profile and going like savory with it and switching it over to like almost like a side dish main dish type of adding some like chili some lime some other more like savory profiles yeah we i'm definitely open to exploring stuff like that um, I think, I think things like that, I just don't know if it would, if, if it would sell as well. Sure. Um, well, okay. In that regard, what, where do you see the commercial meat industry going? Do you see it continuing to cater? Now these are my words, not anybody else's to cater to the, um, to the berry bombs and to the, you know, the more dessert leaning meads and, and the, the drier stuff and the more technical stuff is going to, I say technical is the wrong term, but the non dessert type stuff is going to just kind of be um, supplemental or do you see it being that there's actually going to be growth in those areas? I, I mean, we, we see really good sales on all the fruited stuff, you sure. know, like, and we, we don't go for super sweet. We, we like to try to make like really balanced drinkable. And they, yeah. Um, so I think, and I think it's kind of regional too. Um, In what like, regard? Sorry? In what regard, like the, the, the meaderies that make those profiles are regional or the desire of, for those? I, I think, the, I think the, the tastes are kind of regional. Like it seems like the, the Midwest, you know, kind of area, like yeah. they yeah. love like their like really high finishing gravity, like sweet, yes. you know, kind of like sugar bombs, yep. um, not, not in a derogatory way, but like, no, I think, you know, they, they call it like the sugar belt. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like that region is like, they love those like big, really intense, you know, fruited, like yeah, stuff from like pips and, you know, shrams, you know, it's all like very like thick, you know, yes. intense, sweet. Uh, I think if we tried to, to put out that style, here in Washington, it wouldn't, I, I don't know that we would have as much of a response to that here. I think that, um, you know, kind of, kind of the West Coast is kind of, uh, you know, tends more towards like maybe a little drier, a little more balanced, a little more drinkable um, styles. Now, do you see it in that regard? Do you see a difference between Washington and Arizona? I mean, selling Ari meat here in Arizona, you got to be, I mean, from basically one of the top five meaderies distribution wise, probably in the world, certainly in the country. And you, you have to at least notice some sort of difference in the flavor profile um, desires of your clients. Yeah, I think that Arizona, I think. Um, I think that the the styles we were making at Superstition tended to be a, a little a little bit sweeter. I think the work, the stuff we're making up here is a little drier, a little more balanced, a little more drinkable. Um, it is it is kind of an interesting question because Superstition kind of like 
pioneered the market in Arizona. Definitely. And so I think they kind of created the market a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, I, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in Arizona as more, you know, I'm seeing more meteries in Arizona start to open up and yeah. Have you, uh, have you been to any of the other meteries here, drinking horn, scale and feather, Arizona meat company or meeting room? I haven't. Do you feel that the, uh, that the meat scene is getting too, I don't want to say too bro-ish, but do you feel that it's, it's growing in an unhealthy direction or do you feel like it's growing in a more, um, a more inclusive direction? I, I don't know. Um, my hope would be that as I think that me being such a young and kind of small industry, mm -hmm. I, I hope that it um, chooses to become more inclusive and welcoming than kind of craft beer has been sure. to a lot of people. Um, and I, I hope that people start to have those conversations um, because I think that it is a choice that the industry can make. I get looked at of oddly when I bring those type of conversations up. People look at me like, well, what do you mean that you're not for the secondary market? And what do you mean that you're not, you know, and I, like I said, I'm guilty as everybody. It's not like I've never used the secondary market, but you know, the more I, I think about it and look into it and everything, it, it makes it really hard to support something like that when there's people like yourself and other fantastic mead makers out there that are, Again, these are buzz terms and stuff, but doing it the right way and everything, you know, it makes it really hard to try to justify paying exorbitant secondhand market prices for me that I can get equal quality for a fair market price. Yeah. One thing I haven't seen out of Art, Art of them is uh, a whole lot of traditionals. You guys staying away from those on purpose or are you guys got so, planned in the so varieties? We, we have done one traditional. Um, that we released recently. It was a coffee blossom yes. honey traditional. Uh, traditional meads, I like to reserve those for when we find a really kind of special and unique honey yes. that we, that we want to highlight. So I've, I've found that um, it seems like not as many people are excited by those. Mm -hmm. um, it's really so, important. So I, I, I really like to, but I really like, I like making those. I think it's, um, it's to, to relate it to the beer world. It's kind of like when a brewer can make a really, you know, a really good Pilsner. Okay. You know, like, you know, uh, a ton of brewers can, you know, throw a bunch of fruit in something or throw a bunch of hops in something and it's, and it's probably going to be pretty good. But if, if you can make a really good Pilsner, then, you know, like you, you can kind of tell when, when that person's a really, a really good brewer. They have a lot of the technical aspects dialed in. They know what, yeah. it, what, what it, it is to, to brew. Yeah. And, and I think the same thing is kind of true of traditionals. You know, there's nothing to hide behind. You're not, you, you know, there's no fruit, there's no adjuncts. It's just, you know, honey and, and process. Right. Um, do you have a favorite meadery that's not art of them? Somebody that you either have or haven't been to, somebody who you're dying to try? I mean, I know you, there's probably a ton of places you have been to. Yeah, um, I, I really like the stuff that Lost Cause. Yes, down in California. Down in California. Yep. Um, I think they're doing really incredible stuff. Uh, Obergard, I mean, they're doing great stuff. Yeah. Um, and we've, we've actually got a collaboration with them coming out soon. <laughs> um, I'm dying to try something, something on that line, brother. I can't, cannot wait for that. Yeah. We actually, uh, just gotta, just gotta get filtered and then put into bottles. Yeah. I'm coming up to, uh, Washington here in the first week of June. I'm going to be up there for about eight days doing a whole, uh, metery tour and visiting areas awesome. i don't know what we got planned but 
I hope I can make it up there to Art of them trying to get down into Oregon as well and do a whole north south road trip thing going on. Cool. Yes. Yeah, yep. you have to come visit us. Definitely dying to come up there to Bellingham. It's been a hot stretch uh, since I've been up there. I, I, um, so, you guys, uh, you had mentioned in the um, before we were recording everything that you had another um, another situation that you guys got going on up there. You 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 cool with mentioning that? Give a little yeah. yeah, yeah. So so we're um, we thought you know. Why open one business in the middle of a pandemic when you can open two? Uh, <laughs> so, so we're we're opening a a coffee shop uh, right next to our space that's also going to serve natural wine, beer, and cider. And we're we're going to actually start making cider, uh, and we'll we'll make cider under both of those brands. So, the, so the name of that um, business is Black Fern. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, and then so we'll make we're making black fern cider and artem cider, and kind of the idea is that black fern will be um, kind of similar to kind of what's on the market, you know, um, kind of uh, lower margin, higher volume. Okay. Sort of stuff. Um, is it going to be session? Eventually, well, it, it'll be cider. Oh, so yeah. Um, and then we'll make art of them cider and that'll be more like kind of similar to what we do with the mead, you know, heavily fruited kind of wild flavors, um, you know, priced, priced a little bit higher than, you know, like a, a traditional cider in, okay. in, in bottles. Got you. Now that I haven't seen any of those, um, going around too much commercially, uh, cider in bottles. I like the sound of that. That's it. That's going to be, uh. I mean, at least from any mead makers commercial. Um, what made you want to get into the cider game? Just being around up in Washington with all the apples around and having a- Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many, there's so many apples here. It's just, it seems silly not to take advantage of it. Sure. And, and I think it's, uh, it's, it can be a little more approachable that, than mead. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of a way to introduce people to our brand sure. and to kind of attract people to our tasting room and, and just kind of bring them in. Get all those feelers out, get it as far out as you can. Bring yeah. them in, reel them in. Next thing you know, they're buying <laughs> still meat and they're loving it. I, I, I'm all full on board with that. Um, you guys have uh, uh, session meads in your future? Yeah, definitely. Definitely doing session meads. Yeah, as, as soon as we've got, you know, the bright tanks in and we can start carbonating stuff, um, we'll definitely be doing, exploring some session needs. How about um, some long-term barrel age projects or anything like that? We have some going right now. Ooh. Uh, we've got, we've got four barrels full right now. Um, we've got, so let's see, we've got a raspberry strawberry blueberry mead with vanilla in a bourbon barrel i'm in we've got a uh raspberry blueberry mead yes uh, in a red wine barrel that had uh bourbon finished in it we've got a, a mead with belgian dark candy syrup in a uh bourbon rum bourbon barrel that's and then a another raspberry blueberry mead in a bourbon rum bourbon barrel as well. Man, you guys are doing it right and big up there. Hopefully, uh, hopefully those at least make it to the online store. You know, not just reserved for uh, locals. Yeah, I I think you know they probably will. Yes, got it, <laughs> got it, got it, got to share that stuff with them. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I I love doing barrel aging stuff. You know, that's it's really fun and. The flavors you can get are, you know, pretty incredible. Uh, yeah, I'm huge on the barrel aging stuff from from meads to beers, everything, and I'm really um, starting to develop a real taste for the stuff that was aged in uh, wine barrels. It adds a really unique character to it that I've not really tasted in any other. Um, you don't get, you can't get that same type of character from like a 
a new barrel, a French, a Hungarian oak. It doesn't matter. It, it's just very unique character. And I don't know, I'm really. Yeah. Um, you guys see yourself, uh, since how there's so many wineries there, do you see yourself doing, say, like a line of uh, wine barrel age needs or even getting into like a little bit of the uh, Piment series? We're definitely going to make a Piment this year. Um, I would love to do some wine barrel age stuff. I've, I've done some before and turned out really good. Yes. So I definitely want to do that. Um, we might even explore making like a, like a natural wine. Ooh. Well. Have you ever thought about doing a dandelion wine? No. I've, I've been seeing a lot of clatter about those on the uh, underground channels and Reddit forums and whatnot. I was interesting. Yeah, I, I know it's a thing out there that's happened. Um, I talked to uh, Dan Schreppler over at Space Time Mead and Cider Works in Pennsylvania, and he had done one. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. I apologize. It was uh, Jason Phelps over at uh, Ancient Fire, and he had done one before, and he said it was received really well. And I would I would love to try one of those myself from, uh, from you know, the mead makers aspect and everything. I, I, yeah something that you don't really see a whole lot of. Do you, are you guys uh, planning on working with any like experimental flavors or anything on the uh, more unique side coming out? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're always experimenting and trying new things. Um, we got a small batch of uh, strawberry cucumber coming out. Ooh, that sounds delicious. Delicious. Um, yeah, especially as a, uh, you know, as things start to open up again, we'll we'll start doing some small batches, and we're we're hoping to start kegging meat and serving it, you know, on draft. Yes. Um, that that was kind of our plan before COVID happened, was mm -hmm. to primarily serve things on draft and uh, you know fill growlers and do a little bit of bottling. Yeah. Uh, we've we've kind of gone the other direction so far and just exclusively done bottles um but we're definitely excited to you know the the small batches it it doesn't make a lot of sense to do them and bottle them mm -hmm. um but but I, i'm excited you know when things when things really open up here we'll definitely be be doing some really like you know 10 10 gallon like crazy experimental stuff and, and putting it on draft now that's what I love. It's basically like what you the equivalent of like a bench trial there in your meat. Yeah. You run it through, see how many your yays and nays, thumb up, thumb down, see where it goes. Um, do you guys have any distribution outside of uh, up there in Washington and here in Arizona? No, uh, not right now. We really want to focus on Washington, mm -hmm. and we we really want to kind of build community around our products and you know build relationships with with everybody that's that's getting our mead yes and and all you know the retail partners that we're working with um that's super important to us so we we want to we want to kind of grow slowly and intentionally and um make sure that we kind of don't lose sight of that that's wonderful it's, yeah, so we're not we're not trying to you know go too big too quick. Um, yeah, so I, I don't I don't see us going you know too far outside of Washington. Gotcha. For, yeah. for a while, and and you know the the whole reason we were in Arizona is because we had built those relationships with people. Right. And uh, prior connections. Yeah. Yeah, that, which makes perfect sense. I mean, that's. It, it, and it's really a unique, um, unique situation in that regard. You know, you have you guys haven't been here and everything like that. And personally, I seem to be reaping all the benefits. So I'm not gonna <laughs> tout that down. But uh, so you guys seem to be doing it pretty big and heavy there. Is there anything that you guys haven't uh, made that you, or anything that you personally haven't made that you wanted to say because of uh, restrictions to either? Um, uh, resources or money or anything like that you know if you could do like the biggest boldest thing you ever done what would that be i would love to do 
like a crazy big mead with all local berries. All local berries, okay. Yeah, so so Whatcom County, the county we're in, um, is one of the biggest the biggest like raspberry producing mm -hmm. areas. Um, and and I mean, there's just so much fruit around here. So I I would love to do. You know, just a a huge, you know, mellow mel. Whatcom County punch. Yeah. Dude, that would be awesome. Yeah, I have a uh, family that was up there in the uh, Linden area. I spent many a summers up there in, in that whole area. And, and yes, there is nothing but produce going on up there, berries most specifically, and it is phenomenal. I would love to see a nice uh, huckleberry meat even come out of Washington. Yeah, that'd be good. Oh, so one of the things I'd seen um, kind of recently floating around in the, the – um, the mead forms and whatnot was somebody talking about, or a couple of different people actually talking about using extra virgin olive oil to knock down the head during fermentation. Have you ever heard of doing that? Uh, I've never heard of that. And I don't know why you would do that when firm cap exists. See, and there's a lot of people out there that, um, again, unfortunately not being a home brewer, I don't uh, get to do a lot of this practice. But there's a lot of people out there that seem to be much more into what I would equate to like the natural remedies as opposed to buying something quote unquote chemical or man made. Yeah. Um, you know, the raisins are nutrients, people. Yeah. I, I think that's a little silly personally. Yeah. I, I, I I'm just trying to learn as much as I can <laughs> all the different realms. And it's one of the questions I've been seeing floating around. So I, every time I see one of these funky questions, I, I try to write it down so I can at least get some sort of, uh, say, professional uh, input on the situation there. Yeah, I would never put olive oil in our needs to knock down the head. Um, <laughs> it, seemed, yeah, it seemed like a pretty um, off-kilter thing, but... Uh, that is one of the things that I'm noticing a lot in the homebrew community versus the professional community is there's a lot of, um, what's, what's they call them? Old wives tales. You know, a lot of um, tribal knowledge that's passed down that a lot of people hold firmly to regardless of what say science and modern practice tells us. Yeah. I think that, um, I think that you would find, a lot, uh, you know, the vast majority of, of professional mead makers are going to, you know, hew pretty closely to those, uh, you know, modern scientific practices mm -hmm. because they work. Sure. And, and they've been proven over time. Um, but, you know, if you want to throw olive oil in your mead, then more power to you. But Or not use sulfates and like... <laughs> you know, ferment for a year and a half and still have it go sideways on you. Yeah. I mean, you, you can do whatever you want, but yeah, I won't be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be doing anymore. Okay. <laughs> and, and Hey, I think that's something that a lot of people should take a uh, reference to, you know, you don't, it doesn't even really need any more explanation than that. You know, you have a premier world-class professional mead maker saying you won't catch me doing that. And I think that's all it should really take to stop people from doing something is um, the, some of those unfounded, unsound ideas. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is learn as much as I can before I start making my own mead. Uh, determined that my first batch is going to be um, a lychee mead, and I am dying to get that underway. Yeah. But I could definitely went through summer uh, here in Phoenix because I'm not trying to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know enough about Kavik yeast. <laughs> but I'm learning so give us some time um, if you could only uh, drink one of the meads that you ever made for the rest of your life you were only allowed to drink one of your brands of meat not brand but just one of the flavor profiles that you ever created what one would you pick Ooh, that's a hard one um, I mean you've got I'm sure hundreds of flavor profiles under your belt this time teas you got barrel aged ones you've got yeah. Boy, that's hard. Um, 
I think I think one of my favorites has been um, one of the ones we made at Superstition. Okay. Uh, uh, Amante, have you had that one? I do not believe I have had that one. Uh, but but the barrel aged version of that. So Amante was a mead with Belgian dark candy syrup, uh, cacao nibs, cinnamon, uh, coffee, and and hatch red chilies. Ooh, gosh, dang, that sounds delicious. Yeah, and it is very good. Um, yeah. What vintage would that be? What year should I be looking for if I'm going to find one of those? I don't remember. Oh, okay, so it wasn't. It was, certainly wasn't within the past couple of years. It was a while ago. Gotcha. Yeah, so but I'm be fine. We're, we're, we're probably going to do something similar. Okay. Um, up here. Uh huh. Just because I love that flavor profile so much. Are you? Um, we'll, 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 we're gonna. I'm. I'm gonna tweak the recipe a little bit. It won't be. It won't be the exact same. Sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I really like that one. Are you taking? Uh, how how to word it? Did you bring your playbook up there, so to speak? <laughs> necessarily, you're calling the same plays, but it's like we can. We can we can modify the plays to fit our our current need for the game. Well, you know, like a, a lot of the processes are are similar. Sure. I mean, there's only so much that can vary from you know fermenting water. Yeah. And yeah so, you know, ha having a lot of experience doing it, um, the ways that we did it, you know, just makes sense to kind of, you know, take that and and run with it. Yeah. Um, you know, we have we have kind of. Tweak, tweak things and, and, you know, refining things over time, sure. um, you know, with, with more research and experience. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're not, we're not trying to make the same things that we made there because, um, oh, we just got so many ideas. Right. There's so much new ground to be covered anyway. I guess it's more, it's not so much that you're bringing the playbook down there, it's that you're bringing the tools with you on how to assemble your own playbook. You know, all the experience yeah. from the, like you said, learning how to upscale from 50 gallons to 1,000 gallons and your, your business processes and all those different things, which is, uh, man, you can't, you can't pay for that type of experience. You, know, you couldn't go to school and get that type of experience for the money that it would cost. Yeah. So, which is super nice. Um, do you guys have a um, are you you guys have a tap room there at your at your facility right has it has it been open yet at all or you guys been closed? yeah it has um, you know we've got some outdoor seating and uh, okay. you know, in, indoor seating has been allowed at uh, a limited capacity okay nice past few months um, yeah so you know people are starting to come out again mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're excited to see that you know, pick up a little bit in the future. Yeah, you mentioned in the beginning that you guys were very strong into community and, and trying to support the community. Have you seen them touting that flag back and supporting you guys? Have you gotten a lot of support during the pandemic locally? Yeah, I I, I think as much as can be expected, you know, we're, we're, we're a new business mm -hmm. and we're in, we're in a building in an area where there were not any businesses. Oh, so we're, we're, we're one of the first businesses in, um, you know, the, the first floor of this building. Okay. So people aren't used to seeing a business here. Got you. And so I, it's, I think it's been a little challenging for us because we're a new business and, you know, meat is kind of a, like a new thing for a lot of people. Sure. Um, so I, I think as, as more people start to like get out of the house and we're, we're in a really like beautiful walkable area. We're right by the water. There's a really cool park right next to us. Mm -hmm. um, they built a pump track like right next to us. Oh yeah. You know, for bicycles. Uh, so I, we love our location and it's awesome. But I think, you know, I, I think a lot of people were, when, when they did go out, they were going to, more familiar places. Sure. Um, you know, kind of going to the comfort spots. Yeah. Now, do you, 
a lot of people might not know, but Bellingham is home to uh, Western Washington University, probably the third largest uh, university there in Washington. You think you're going to get a lot of the college people coming down? I mean, you guys got to be pretty close. I mean, Bellingham's not that big of a town. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know that we're going to get a lot of college students. That was never kind of our target market. Oh, okay. I was kind of thinking it might have been. Um, but that was given previous knowledge of the area, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, if, if we do, if we do kind of capture that crowd mm -hmm. and entice them in, like, that would be great. But I, I think our, our, our kind of target market is, is folks that are a little older, you know, late twenties and up, um, you know, craft, craft beer people. It's kind of what we see a lot. Now, okay, so in that regard, do you have any plans to say, um, do any uh, collaborations with any restaurants, get any mead food pairings going on there locally or serve food at the meadery? Yeah, so. <laughs> hey, Bubba. Yeah, I'm doing a video, okay? okay Love you. Take Thank you. Take your and go. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so food pairings there at the meter, anything like that planned? Uh, we, we've had a little bit of food here, like pre-prepared stuff. We're, we're going to be kind of moving away from that because we're just not crazy about what we've had. Okay. Uh, but we've, uh, a, a local bakery has just opened up behind us. Um, so we're going to start serving their food. Okay. And uh, are, are you familiar with Skull? The meat hall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're, uh, I think they're going to open another location in oh. the building here. Nice. Now that'll be cool. And yeah, so we're super excited about that um, because they're obviously doing great stuff. Yes. More mead. They, they do, they do really cool pairing dinners and, you know, they, they serve a lot of mead. They serve a lot of our mead. Um, Nice. So, yeah, I think that'll that'll be really cool. Very cool. Yeah, I'm always interested to hear what um, mead makers are have to say about their um, their flavor profiles being paired with food. You know, it, it's one thing for some some consumer to pick something up off the shelf, but if they can, you know, pick up what the uh, what the artisan was trying to pick up and, and marry those things together, I think that's a really unique uh, and special thing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super fun working with, you know, working with chefs and, and coming up with, you know, dishes and pairings for, for different meats. You said you had a bakery that was opening there or had just yeah. opened there? They're opening next Saturday. Opening next Saturday. Now, I wonder if you guys could get some, like, crazy yeasts from them and make something and do, like, a, a brewery or a meatery bakery collab or something. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure we'll do something. They're talking about doing like a, a s'mores type thing to pair with our s'mores mead. Yes, I'm a hundred percent on board with that. That I think that s'mores pro flavor profile is one of the ones that, while is uh, used a lot, can't get played out. You know, chocolate, marshmallow, graham crackers. It's it's that's a pretty that. man. That's a big one. Um, so give a little more kind of low-key questions and whatnot we got going on there um see if uh if you were gonna be a girl scout cookie what type of girl scout cookie would you be samoa that's a man of my own heart right there man. <laughs> Coconut, chocolate caramel right there is through and through yeah. and we actually made um i don't i don't know if you've tried them but we made a series of girl scout inspired meads girl scout cookie inspired meads I did not get to try those ones. I was, I missed the train on that one, unfortunately. Yeah, I think we, we still have some. Oh, up there, I haven't seen any here at, at the few places around town that I've looked. Yeah, um, I don't I don't think we ever sent any to Arizona, but. Oh, okay. That, yeah, wow. yeah, we did a, a, a like a Thin Mint. Yeah. Uh, a S'mores and a Samoa. Yes, I, I if, if I get up there and watch, or when I get up there in Washington, if I make it up there, I would definitely be uh, buying yeah. All of those things that is phenomenal man uh who dog person <laughs> cat person uh both 
I'd say more dog than cat, but I have a dog and a cat. Okay. There you go. Yeah, I like – I'm the same myself, but I, I tend to lean a little more towards cat person because I like uh, animals that are a little more self-sufficient, you know, a little more yeah. – and so to speak my dog i have is super needy he's <laughs> I, love, I love him to death but he is such a princess he wants you to look at him and hold him and call him all the time and tell him he's pretty and my my dog's the same <laughs> <laughs> fantastic uh all right here's the big one the the super divisive one fruit on your pizza yes or no yes yes Another pineapple pineapple on pizza Yes, pineapple does belong in pizza. How about barbecue sauce on your pizza? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I like <laughs> to see, I, I'm into experimental stuff. Whenever somebody wants to take something that's quote unquote traditional and do something, with it, do something with it outside of the norm, I'm definitely on board with that. Me too. Uh, let's see here. Um, do, do, do. What would you say was the... Um, biggest difficulty so far that you've come up with opening the meter oh boy there there have been a lot um so when when we first were looking at the building we were in we we're actually looking at a completely different layout okay uh, originally the whole kind of ground floor was was supposed to be an open market sort of situation and so our original plan was actually to have like a small tasting bar on the first floor and then have all our production in the basement. Okay. And we like signed the lease, we got permits, we, you know, hired an architect, you did drawings, and then we, we got our federal permit and then we um, were working on our state permit and they told us no. Washington state. Yeah. They said, no, you can't do that. Try again. Or like it's actually they said no and you can you can continue to try to uh, you know proceed with this permit but if you get rejected then you have to wait another year to resubmit did they say at least what it was that was being contested it was it was the fact that our production was in the basement there wasn't direct access to outside oh and they they don't like doing anything that will set a precedent for anyone else. I guess I could understand that. They don't want to yeah. say... So if, if, it's, if it's anything outside of the norm, they don't like to do it because they don't want it right. to... Right. To make it easier for anything anybody else to do anything like that. Well, you let them do it, so why can't we do it? Exactly. Gotcha. So, so that, was, that was a challenge. Um, so after that happened, we were actually looking at different spaces. Um, and uh, they, they kind of brought us back to the table here because they kind of liked our concept and um, wanted us to be here. And so, you know, eventually we made it work. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. But then we actually signed, we actually signed a, a, a lease for our current space in the beginning of March of 2020. Oh, wow. So yeah, beginning. Yeah, right before everything shut down. Yeah. And then we had our tasting room grand opening in November, uh, two days before Washington shut down for the second time. I remember seeing that online. That would have been brutal. Yeah, so it's been, challenging for sure it's been a weird year man um but we've just we've just kept grinding away well it's good to hear that you guys are surviving your community supporting you you know as, as well as can be expected yeah but online sales been been pretty good i'm assuming online sales have been pretty good um we've got a we've got a club yes uh, you know a bottle club so that's that's been really good for us um, it's kind of a, a combination of a lot of things that we weren't expecting to do for several years. The bottle club itself or the things you're promoting? Um, the just the, the bottle club and, and retail distribution. Oh, okay. We were, we were hoping to kind of grow into all of those things more slowly because the, all of those things take a lot of work 
and a lot of kind of intentional effort um, to pull off well. And when 2020 happened, it was, you know, all the plans are out the window, do everything possible to Sink make it work. What, yeah. what? A sink or swim moment, you do everything you yeah. can to make sure to stay afloat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you see yourself dialing back on any of those things as, you know, not necessarily the volume of bottles, but say uh, just not increasing those things, but increasing all the in-house stuff? Um, I, I don't think we're going to decrease anything. I think we're, you know, we're kind of, we're, we're doing what we're doing and we're, we're kind of, um, you know, e even though this wasn't the plan, this is kind of kind of just what what we're doing now, and right. We we like how it's working. We have a great sales guy that kind oh. of um, takes care of everything in Seattle mm -hmm. uh, for us, and and we really like working with him. Um, and we we really like all of our you know retail partners, all the places we are. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't we don't really want to pull back from that. That's good to hear. Um, yeah. And, and we don't we don't want to get into a situation where you know we've gone into all these you know retail places and then suddenly disappear. Sure. You know that's that's always disappointing. Like I, as a consumer, if if I go to a bottle shop and I know I can find like all my favorite stuff there, and then suddenly it disappears, that's always kind of disappointing. Agreed uh, very much as a, also as a consumer, there's nothing worse than going into your bottle shopping like, oh yeah, we don't carry them anymore. They change distribution or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't, we don't want to do that. We want people to get our stuff, you know, kind of where, where they have found it. Uh, I got to move here so I can plug my computer in so it doesn't die. Oh, no worries, brother. I would say I would, I've been taking up a bunch of your time. I don't know if you got going or a few more minutes. Yeah. All right. All right. Looks like we had to go a little scenery change there. <laughs> um, well, I appreciate let me taking up some of your time. You got a few more minutes, or yeah, yeah, I got a few more minutes. Right on, man. So um, now that you're up there in uh, Washington. Um, and you've been here in Arizona, so you know what a hot day is. Uh, if you're going out, you know, say out hiking or something like that, what is like your most, the most refreshing mead that you're taking out with you on a trail? You got a spot in your backpack or your day pack for one bottle of mead. What are you taking with you? Ooh, um, I would say I would take our uh, pale-eyed blackbird. Okay, there you go. Uh, black currant vanilla mead really like nice and tart and refreshing um with kind of like a nice nice kind of vanilla backbone now kind of off question have you found black currants difficult to acquire lately i've heard from a couple different people that black currants are kind of on the more difficult side to get you know we've only made that one product okay uh, well that and one other thing with black currants so we haven't we haven't used a ton of black currant so that's um, I haven't, haven't had any issues with that so far. Well, that's good to hear. I like that. Um, is there anything that you've tried to make in the past that you haven't been able to make because of availability of product? Um, you know, no, nothing that comes to mind. Well, that's, hey, that's even better to hear. I mean, I always like to hear an interesting story, but it's also good to hear that, you know, that what you need to make your quality products is available to you when you need it. You know, I haven't seen a whole yeah. lot. I haven't seen you. Have you guys used any uh, metal foam honey yet? Oh, I mean, I haven't really even tried to get that. You, on purpose, uh, I, you? I guess that's, yeah, that's definitely one thing. I, I would love to, to use metal foam honey, but um, yeah, haven't, haven't really even tried because I know how difficult it is to, to source that. Now, because of the expensiveness of honeys like that and the scarcity, do you see mead ever getting to the place where craft beer is or at least starting to go that direction or do you see it like say plateauing at a certain point and it'll just never get past that um i think i think we're gonna see mead um 
I, I mean, I think the industry has grown a lot over the past couple of years. Uh -huh. and, and I think it's growing pretty quickly. I don't think it's ever going to be at the same, you know, level craft beer is. Uh, but I think it's, even, even if me can have 10% of the current market that craft beer has right now, I think that would be huge. By comparison to where they're already at, by where yeah. the is already at. Yeah, I think mead is still a pretty, you know, I, I think it also depends where you are. You know, if, if, you're in, if you're in Michigan, like I think there's a huge amount of awareness like in Michigan, you know, right. about, what, about what mead is and, you know, and, and people are enjoying it there. I think that I think it takes kind of a critical mass of meteries in kind of a geographical area for people to start like noticing it and, and understanding what it is. I got you. That that makes sense. I hadn't necessarily looked at it like that, but when you when you verbalize it like that, that makes a lot of sense when you have a lot of saturation of something in the market there. A lot of people don't really, for lack of a better term, don't have a choice but to be exposed to it. And yeah. Uh, you know, if you're a craft beverage consumer, the fact that there's just so many there, you can't really ignore them. As opposed to if you're in somewhere like Arkansas, where they don't have any meteries or anything like that, something is going to be uh, really foreign to you. And that's going to yeah. be a lot of work to to break all those. Um, well, I mean, you guys broke in mead here in Arizona and try to do that somewhere else. I mean, that could take a lot of time and effort and energy. And Yeah. And I think that you know, for the industry, the more, the more meteries there are, the better. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that, um, I think that the meat industry is kind of like, kind of where the craft beer industry was in like the late eighties, early nineties. Oh, wow. It's a lot farther back than most people say. Usually people say about 10 years ago. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think it's still at the place where if people, if people have tried a, a poor example of mead, they just think that's what mead is. Correct. Yeah, I agree 100%. So, and I think that's, that's like kind of where the craft beer industry used to be. If people tried, you know, a bad IPA, they're like, oh, I, I don't like craft beer. Or I don't like IPA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now you're, you're probably not going to find anyone who would say that, you know, they would say like, oh, I don't like this brewery's IPA or I don't like this specific one, or I don't like this brewery, they're not gonna say, I don't like craft beer. I just carte blanche across the board. Yeah, but I think mead is still in the place where, you know, there's just not enough awareness for people to, to kind of know that there's kind of this whole range of what mead can be. Yeah. And so if they try one thing, like, and maybe it's just not a style, of mead that they like, or maybe, you know, that meadery just doesn't kind of fit their, you know, their taste and their flavor, flavor profile. They'll just kind of write off mead in general. Right. Um, do you see a lot of your non-traditional mead consumers being converts from the beer area or from the wine department? More from beer. And that, I, I see that a lot as well. And as a distributor here in Arizona, I'm trying to tap into the um, more into the well, I'm trying to tap into all markets, but I'm focusing a lot on the wine market because I feel like it's a very, um, there's so many similarities between mead and wine already, you know, especially in like the brewing process and everything like that. I feel like it's almost like a natural step over, but there's not a whole lot of advocacy for that. And um, I think what, what, what I've found is that wine drinkers are not as receptive to mead um and again this is a, this is a generalization but sure. i i found that wine drinkers are not as receptive to mead because they have an idea of what wine is okay you know when 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 a, a wine drinker goes to the store and they say like i want a, a cabernet from napa or you know i want a chardonnay like they have an idea of what that's going to be like. Sure. But when you have, you know, a, a craft beer person, you know, I think they're more open 
to new flavors and, and they're looking for, you know, new things that, you know, they haven't tried before, you know, they're going to walk into a craft beer store and, and say like, what's new, what's good? Like, tell me what's cool right now. As to where your wine drinkers are much more your, I'm going for what I already know or something very close to what I already know. Don't bother me with anything else. I'm, I'm yeah. this is what I like. Yeah. Yeah, I have to, I have to agree um, that I, I feel from my experience personally that that is a lot of the way, but um, I, I'm still going to try to go for that anyway, man. I, I have, have to advocate for me in as many places as possible because yeah. it, 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 it's too, it's too, it's too cool not to, man. And it sounds kind I, of. I cool. think, and I, I think the, the, the biggest thing is you have to get the people that are selling it on board. They, sure. have, to, they have to know what it is, they have to know that it's good, they and they have to care. know how to talk to people about it. Mm -hmm. Because if you have. A, we, we have an incredible account here in town who is like an olive oil and vinegar like store and tasting room. Okay. And they put Armied on the front of their counter and they talk to people about it and they like it and they know how to tell people about it. Right. And they sell, they just sell bottles all day. That's so awesome. But if you have, you know, the best, craft beer store ever but the people that are working there don't yep. care and don't know what it is and don't know how to talk about it it just sits there on the shelf and doesn't it move it sits there on the shelf yep. yeah i hear you man that's i'm dealing with similar type of situations here it's all about trying to make people care about something that you're passionate about it's not a not an easy task no, and, and it's really, I think it's really, it's about education and it's about being able to, you know, tell a story about a product or a business. And like, that's, that's what we find. Um, like the vast majority of interactions we're having with people coming in, especially, you know, first time people coming in, it's, it's, it's just, it's education and it's get, getting people to try to just like try it. Yeah. You know, once people take a sip and they try it, they're on board. It's like it's like fishing. It's like well, as soon as you can get them to bite, they're hooked. But yeah. the bite is is the is the tricky part, man. Yeah. I uh, I applaud you guys for everything you're doing up there. Um, I'm a huge fan of your entire line of everything that I've had so far. I'm even a fan of the stuff that I haven't had because I <laughs> your heart and passion and, and soul into it. It like. Again, if anybody who's watched any of my uh, interviews knows one of, or any of my reviews, there, there's something in certain meads, and I call it the X factors because I'm cheesy and stupid, but <laughs> it, it often is that one, there's something in a mead you can tell, and it's passion, it's love, it's, it's energy, whatever you want to call it, but it's always that thing you can tell when the mead maker cares about what they're doing as opposed to just putting bottles out for the sake of putting bottles out. And, and, and I applaud you guys for it. So thank, thank you. you guys up at Art of Them for, for doing what you guys do. Um, been uh, consuming about an hour and a half or two hours of your time at this point. So I'm definitely going to let you go. Uh, hopefully we can have you back on sometime in the future. Yeah, I'd love to. Right on. So uh, go follow Carlos and Micah over there at Art of Them, um, YouTube, uh, Facebook, I don't know if you guys are on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter, so I don't know who is and isn't. Yeah, we are on Twitter, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. All the normal places. Yep. So go give those guys a follow. Buy some bottles online from them. Support them locally if you're there. Support one of their retailers, anything you can to help these guys out. Um, get them established and help them become a bedrock there in the Bellingham community. So thank you, Carlos, for being here today. And hopefully we can talk in the future, man. Look forward to it.